Our universe is filled with mysteries. As our technology improves, we're able to reach farther out into the cosmos and observe objects that are more distant and more ancient than ever before. What we may find could help explain the origins of the universe itself. One project called the Square Kilometer Array Observatory plans on throwing these observations into overdrive. The massive collaboration between 14 countries spread out over a remarkable 3,000 kilometers will collect radio wave information that has the potential to map the entire structure of the universe and help us understand things like why it's expanding, how galaxies first formed, and whether there's any alien life or any habitable planets out there. Welcome back to Fact Nominal. Today, we're talking about SKA, the most ambitious telescope program in history. There's so much we still don't know about our universe. For one thing, it's mind-bogglingly vast. No combination of words could ever really come close to describing just how large it is. There are an estimated 30 billion trillion stars in the known universe. That's a 30 followed by 21 zeros. Light can travel the entire circumference of Earth's equator seven and a half times per second. Earth is eight light minutes away from the Sun. Our own Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years across. The known universe is at least 96 billion light years in diameter and it's expanding as you watch this video. The fact that our universe is expanding is a phenomenon that was first proven by Edwin Hubble about a hundred years ago. Yeah, that's the same guy for whom the Hubble telescope was named. By analyzing something called redshift, a term we'll get into shortly, he was able to confidently say that every galaxy in the universe is moving away from every other galaxy at a speed that's directly proportional to its distance. This is called Hubble's Law. A galaxy that's twice as far away as another galaxy is thus moving away from it twice as fast. If it's 15 times farther away from another galaxy, it's moving away from it 15 times as fast. Hubble also managed to prove that the universe is not expanding into pre-existing space. The fabric of space itself is expanding. This is sometimes referred to as metric expansion. The nature of the expansion and the explanation for why it's growing like a loaf of bread rising in the oven or a balloon inflating is still a mystery. Hubble's observation gave rise to the Big Bang Theory. If the universe is expanding, then it must have at some point been incomprehensibly small compared to now. But lots of other questions emerge from this, like whether the universe is infinite or finite. Expansion suggests the universe is finite, yet if it's finite, then what is it expanding into? Is there some sort of membrane? Is it creating space? If the universe is infinite, then how can something that's infinite even expand in the first place? How could something that's infinitely expansive have been created by the Big Bang, a finite, datable event? Another question that comes up has to do with what the universe is made of. It turns out we only really know what about 5% of the stuff in the universe actually is. 5%. Quarks and electrons and protons found inside elements that combine to make compounds that make up the physical stuff we see around us on Earth and can measure in space. This matter and the energies that move them, like electromagnetism and gravity, account for only 5% of what exists in the universe. The rest, scientists simply call dark matter and dark energy. Dark matter takes up about 27% of the stuff we don't know, and dark energy takes up another 68%. And then there are the questions swirling about what happened during the very early years of our universe. How did the first stars and galaxies form? What was going on during the cosmic dark ages some 300 million to a billion years after the Big Bang, when clouds of neutral hydrogen blocked all light in the universe? And what happened just after that, when all the neutral hydrogen was reionized and somehow led to what astronomers call the first light, or cosmic dawn? Lots of these questions could be answered sooner than we think. 
The Square Kilometer Array, or SKA Observatory, is an ambitious project that hopes to map the entire structure of the known universe. The goal is to build a network of radio telescopes, many of which will be in Australia and South Africa in locations where radio interference is very low and views of the Milky Way are very good. The telescopes will be able to combine to form a collecting area of over a square kilometer, or a million square meters. And no, the collecting area isn't just a square kilometer of land on which the telescopes are built. It's the combined surface area of the telescopes themselves. To put this into perspective, the largest telescope in the world right now, the 500-meter Aperture Spherical Telescope in China, has a collecting area of around 70,000 square meters. When SKA is fully operational, it will represent a huge leap in our capacity to observe the cosmos. By 2027, when the project is set to be completed, SKA will have thousands of dishes and a million low-frequency antennas set up in various sites, and they plan to keep growing it, with the eventual goal to expand from South Africa further north. But with so many telescopes scattered across the Southern Hemisphere, the infrastructure needed to coordinate them all needs to be pretty heavy-duty. SKA will require two supercomputers that are 25% more powerful than the best supercomputers in the world right now, allowing data to flow at a rate more than 100,000 times that of the world's current average broadband speed. If everything goes as planned, the network will have a capacity greater than the entire global combined internet traffic circa 2013. There are already four precursor stations in operation, the Meerkat and the Hydrogen Epic of Reionization Array, or HERA, in South Africa, and the Australian SKA Pathfinder and Murchison Wide Field Array in Australia. The hope is that they'll eventually be connected and be able to share data across all four facilities. But they're already doing some pretty amazing things all on their own. There are essentially two ways these arrays can function. The first is with their powers combined. This is called interferometry. The linked telescopes will allow us to see farther back in time and space towards the origins of our universe, possibly revealing the very first stars and galaxies. But if astronomers want to map the universe on the largest scales possible, they can instead use the telescopes individually and then collect the data afterwards. In South Africa, Meerkat already has 64 radio telescopes set up that are working individually to map the universe on a truly huge scale. When it's all said and done, we could very well have a 3D map of the entire universe, with individual galaxies merely points within a grand web. Meerkat's 64 telescopes and their initial observations are already pointing to the fact that such large-scale mapping is possible. Just imagine when a couple hundred thousand telescopes are up and running. And we're not just talking about the artistic renderings you're seeing now. This will be an actual map of the universe. Forget mapping our planet or our solar system. This would be a remarkable achievement. These first ripples of structure that created galaxies come from a time known as Cosmic Dawn. But before Cosmic Dawn, there were the Cosmic Dark Ages. And before the Cosmic Dark Ages, there was something called Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. Before that, some 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe was a smallish ball of hot ionized plasma. We know about cosmic microwave background radiation because we can see its remnants in the form of very, very old photons that were released when the very first neutral hydrogen atoms were forming in the simple, chaotic mess of the very early universe. Astronomers call this period the epoch of recombination, although the re is a bit deceiving because it was really the first time that stuff started combining. When the universe cooled enough after the intense heat directly after the Big Bang, electrons began binding with protons and forming neutral hydrogen. This created photons, light basically. At this time, there wasn't much matter in the universe, so photons were essentially free to roam. 
We can detect these free-roaming photons in the form of cosmic microwave background radiation, which is still sprinkled faintly throughout the universe. Astronomers also call it relic radiation, like it's an ancient remnant of our universal past. To find this radiation, astronomers used a combination of infrared and radio telescopes because the wavelengths they emit are detectable across both spectrums. But then it all went dark. You can think of cosmic microwave background radiation as a buffer between the free-flowing chaos of the early universe and the dark ages that followed. Enormous clouds of neutral hydrogen created during recombination basically snuffed out any glimmer of photon light from the early universe. As a result, we have no idea what was going on during this time, but that doesn't mean that nothing was happening. Actually, some of the most important and mind-blowing stuff you can imagine was happening. The first stars were being born, the first galaxies were starting to swirl, the structural fabric of space as we know it was forming. We just haven't been able to see it. Yet. The Square Kilometer Array and its crazy amount of telescopic potential could allow us to peer back into the time of the Dark Ages. It could also give us valuable insight into how our universe emerged from the Dark Ages, a time known as reionization, when that initial huge cloud of neutral hydrogen was first ionized, and stars and galaxies emerged into a space where light again became visible, and the universe as we know it was born. Born. Radio waves are great for mapping the universe and finding distant objects because they can cut through clouds. And not just our earthly clouds. A lot of our universe, including some of the earliest parts of it, are very cloudy, full of interstellar dust. Radio waves also cover a large amount of the electromagnetic spectrum, so a wide range of frequencies and their corresponding wavelengths can be detected, which helps us figure out where a lot of the objects in our universe are and how old they must be. Radio waves' frequencies range from 30 megahertz to 50 gigahertz. SKA will be able to detect frequencies from 50 megahertz to 20 gigahertz. The main way to detect radio signals is through neutral hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, but it comes in a few different forms – neutral, ionized, and molecular. Molecular hydrogen is the H2 part of H2O. It can form when cosmic dust clouds either get dense enough or cold enough. And although it's certainly important, it doesn't really come into play when we're talking about mapping the universe and finding distant objects with radio telescopes. Most of the hydrogen in the universe is ionized, meaning it's been stripped of its one electron and has a positive charge. This happens when intense UV radiation from stars basically tears neutral hydrogen apart and it becomes a plasma that quickly recombines into higher energies. When hydrogen ionizes, it emits photons or light. Ionized hydrogen is thus present anywhere star formation is going on, and it's the reason we can see distant stars and nebulae without infrared or radio telescopes. Neutral hydrogen is stable atomic hydrogen with one electron and one proton. You can think of neutral hydrogen as the reservoir of fuel that makes star formation possible. If there's a significant amount of neutral hydrogen gas clouds around a very young star cluster, it's likely that as those stars grow, their increasing UV rays will ionize the neutral hydrogen surrounding them. The electrons and protons of neutral hydrogen atoms have two different types of spin. Spin in this sense isn't really like a basketball spinning on someone's finger, but it's pretty much the best visualization we have of the quantum movement of these particles. Sometimes their spins are aligned, meaning they're spinning in the same direction. Other times, their spins flip and they become anti-aligned, meaning the protons and electrons are spinning in opposite directions. When the electron and proton of a hydrogen atom are aligned, they have slightly more energy than when they're anti-aligned. A single hydrogen atom experiences a spin-flip every million years or so, 
But there are so many hydrogen atoms that there's flipping happening pretty much all the time. Because of the change in energy during a spin flip, neutral hydrogen emits a radio frequency of 1420 MHz, which correlates to a wavelength of 21 centimeters. Astronomers call this the hydrogen line, or the 21-centimeter line. It was first discovered in 1930, when astronomers detected a faint hissing at a certain frequency, 1420 megahertz, that they thought was coming from the sun. It eventually became clear that the frequency was coming from the spin flip of neutral hydrogen throughout the universe. By 1952, the first maps of neutral hydrogen began, and through this process, we got our first glimpse of the spiral arms of our own Milky Way galaxy. The SKA Observatory, with all its hundreds of thousands of telescopes and millions of antennae working in coordination, will possibly be able to create a three-dimensional image from all of that neutral hydrogen throughout the universe. It could track the first ripples of structure that webbed out and created individual galaxies and clusters of galaxies. These images could allow astronomers to understand dark energy and also figure out why the universe continues to expand according to Hubble's law. Astronomers are able to calculate how far back in time these types of phenomena go and how far away they are because of something called redshift. Redshift is a type of Doppler effect. Everyone's most likely experienced it through sound. When an ambulance or police car moves towards you, the pitch is high, and as it passes you and moves on down the street, the pitch gets lower. This is because the sound waves arrive in your ear closer together as that beacon of help, or omen of imminent doom, approaches and move farther apart as you're either calling out to it in pain or wiping your brow, thankful the men in blue didn't stop. Sound waves work the same way as radio waves. As stuff in our universe moves farther away from us, its wavelengths become longer, in the same way that the wavelengths from a police siren become longer as it moves past you and continues on to the next crime. But instead of hearing a lower pitch sound, astronomers look for a redder light, which means longer wavelengths, which means that stellar objects are moving away from us. This is how Edwin Hubble figured out that the universe was expanding, by measuring redshifts of super bright objects like quasars, some of which emit more light than entire galaxies. And it's not that the objects themselves are moving, it's that space itself is expanding around us, causing these objects to become farther from us. The higher the redshift, the farther away it is. The farther away it is, the older it is. So far, the oldest and most distant galaxy we've observed is GNZ11, which has a redshift of 11, the highest yet discovered. The galaxy emerged right at the end of the Dark Ages, some 400 million years after the Big Bang. Redshift can be measured from neutral hydrogen and the hydrogen line, too. By looking at the shifts in the line in different directions, astronomers have been able to see how interstellar gas is moving. This was how they first mapped the spiral arms of our Milky Way galaxy. Using this technique, the SKA Observatory, with all its connected telescopes, will hopefully be able to peer even farther back into the dark ages of our universe and give us a glimpse of the magic that was happening when the very first stars appeared amidst clouds of neutral hydrogen gas. SKA could also help us probe the cosmos for Earth-like planets and alien life. Sensitive, remote sensing of young stars may be able to sift through all their surrounding dust to find protoplanets that could give us a better understanding of how Goldilocks planets like Earth are formed. And if there are aliens out there, SKA will be able to detect very weak radio signals that may be coming from far away and could help the ongoing SETI project in the search for extraterrestrial life. 
there's also the possibility that SKA can find amino acids, the building blocks of life, by searching for their spectral signatures at very specific frequencies. There's so much we've yet to learn about our universe. Projects like SKA are helping us sift through the vastness of it to figure out what it all means, helping us turn mathematical equations and theories into concrete observations. It'll be exciting to see how our understanding of the cosmos changes over the next 10 years. Tell us in the comments if you have an interesting fact about the universe and let us know your thoughts. Thank you for watching Factnominal. Don't forget to like and subscribe.